Hi, I'm Thomas Ryan, and I'm hosting Shoreline's brand new podcast. During our Intellectual Barriers to Faith series, we'll be asking some big questions. So we called in some folks from around Shoreline's community who operate in different intellectual settings. Here's a quick sample of my conversation with Dr. Larry Shattuck. He's a PhD in cognitive engineering and a senior lecturer and director of the Human Systems Integration Program over at the Naval Postgraduate School. So I've been blessed with a lot of educational opportunities, not that I'm smart, just that I've had the opportunity to go to school pretty much at the military's expense, so I'm <laughs> appreciative of that. But in pursuing all that education, you learn how to learn, and you learn how to research, and you learn how to analyze things. And so it works in the academic world. It also works in developing your faith. So when I read the Bible, I can be um, you know, deliberate about how I read, how I study, and I can uh, apply, you know, the tools, techniques, approaches, methods that I use in the scientific world or in the engineering world to my faith. Mm -hmm. And so they work equally well in either field. So what's some advice that you would give uh, a Christian who's perhaps uh, in the middle of one of these valleys, intellectually struggling with their faith, uh, not specifically regarding any one particular question, but how do they approach these kind of struggles? So I'd say a couple of things. I would say, first, continue to study, continue to read, continue to ask questions, uh, look for advice from mature Christians, talk with uh, pastors here. Um, but I would also say that uh, to remember that it's a relationship. It, it really is a relationship. So you can... You know, you can read all the books in the world about being a friend or about being a good spouse, but unless you go out and try to be a good friend, try to be a good spouse, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to do that. So uh, you can read all about Jesus, but unless you start walking with him and, and talking with him, you're really not gonna get to know uh, him the way you want. If the relationship is, is the important thing, why do we bother going down this intellectual road? So I think that when you answer those questions from an intellectual uh, standpoint, you deepen your own faith. Uh, and more importantly, or just as importantly, you're able to articulate that faith to others, especially if they come from an academic or an intellectual background. You're able mm -hmm. to, to um, um, I wouldn't say argue with them, because I don't think we should get into arguments about our faith. But I think you're able to articulate to them what it is you believe and why you believe it. Uh, and then I think it also makes you confident in your own belief. If you and you know some people are are uh, more intellectual, some people are more uh, emotional. And I again, I don't mean that in a negative term either. But they're more willing to accept things um, readily and maybe mm -hmm. less uh, on intellect, more maybe on faith. Uh, but I think regardless of whether you're uh, you know an intellectual person or an emotional person. The ability to understand what you believe and why you believe it uh, gives you that much more confidence mm -hmm. uh, in living out your, your Christian faith. To hear the full interview, make sure to check out the podcast. You can find it online at shorelinechurch.org. Go to the resources tab, click on media, and scroll down. Or you can access it on your phone, tablet, or computer through iTunes. Just go to the iTunes store or your podcast app and search Intellectual Barriers to Faith. Have you ever noticed that people who are very bright tend to go down one of two paths? They either think they're really bright and become kind of arrogant, or they have a deep humility. Because as they learn, they understand. Not only do they know a lot, but there's a lot they don't know. And I love Larry's heart, because here's a guy who's a very educated, very bright guy, but a very humble person. I think that's what Jesus does in us when we walk with him and use our minds and our hearts together. Well, last week we started this series that's going to go on for, you know, for a few more weeks called Intellectual Barriers to Faith. And we ask the question, uh, are intellect, thinking well, using our minds, using reason, and faith, belief in Jesus, holding to the Bible, are these two things destined to be enemies and foes who battle like this, or can intelligence and logical thought and deep faith and trust in the Bible and love for Jesus, can these two things be friends? Can they, be, can they kind of live hand in hand? I believe not only can they be friends, I believe God wants them to be. That God wants us to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, but also with all of our mind. 
That means bringing these things together. And I love what Larry said in the video. For some people, they're going to lean more towards the intellectual bent. Some will lead towards more of a, they're just a kind of a deep sense of trust and confidence without having to have everything proved to them. But both of those are needed in all of us. So we continue this journey and this study together uh, by asking the question, aren't all religious expressions equally valid paths to God? This is an intellectual barrier for some people. They'll say, well, listen, you, know, you, you have your Christian faith, and that's fine, but really, pretty much all religions are just different paths. They're equally valid. We're talking about the realm of religion, not the realm of science. So you don't have to be right or wrong. It can just be your faith, and they're all just sort of equally valid. Fair. As a matter of fact, this is such an important topic that Tim Keller, and each week I'm going to mention different books. This is a great book. We've got some in the Shoreline Cafe. Timothy Keller has a book, The Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism. Great book. And his first chapter addresses this topic because it's so prevalent in our world. And also, I want to let you on the website, we're going to be listing uh, different websites that are great for intellectual growth, uh, different books, and that'll keep growing in the coming weeks. And so be sure you check the website for some resources just of what's kind of coming up and what we mention here in the services. Here's the barrier that some people bump into, and it's a fair barrier. We have to look at it and acknowledge it. Here's the barrier. It's the idea that Christianity is the truth and the one true religion. That bothers lots of people. It's, they say it seems very narrow. And we're talking about the realm of religion and faith. Can't we just say that all religions are true? A lot of people want to do this. They want to say, listen, all religions are equally valid, equally true, and Christianity is one of many but can't we just sort of embrace all of them as it's religion? It's, it's all fine. It, it's kind of like this. Um, Sherry and I went down to visit my dad the other day. And we did about a 24, 36-hour visit, drove down to Orange County, visited, came back again. We left where we live, and we went through Highway 68 to Salinas. We kind of cut around Blanco. We got on Highway 101, took it down, kind of down through California, and then we cut across 46 where there's lots of kind of oil wells and almond groves. Across 46, kind of just uh, open, desolate area there. We got on the 5, took it all the way down through L.A., and then we were going to cut off on the 405, take that down into Orange County where my dad lives. But a little ways down the 405, there was a detour. They actually closed it down both ways. They actually shut down the entire highway, and they route you off the freeway through all these different side streets with signs, Got lost only once going through there. Got back on again and got back on the 405 down to my dad's house. Well, that's the way we got there. That's not morally right or wrong. It's just a way to drive to Orange County. But you might go, well, but when I go down that way, I like to go down the coast. I love Highway 1. I love the winding curves. I love in the daytime the beautiful vistas of the ocean. And, and, and you say, that's the way I, I take it. And my dad actually lives like about four minutes from Highway 1. You can take it all the way down and get to his house. So you got one route down Highway 1, you got another one through Central California and down the, through the valleys there, and you could probably find 50 other ways to get there. And it's not morally right or wrong. It's not that there's, you know, this is the right way to get to Orange County. It's just different choices. Some people like a slow, scenic route. Some people like a quicker route. But it's just ways to get there. I mean, isn't that what religion's, you know, like? Isn't it just, a, just different routes? But at the end of the day, they all get us to the same place. And some of you right now, even those of you who put your faith in Jesus, in your mind you're going, yeah, doesn't, that sounds kind of good. I kind of like that. That would be a good thing to, to believe that. Can I tell you? I think that would be nice too. It would be nice if all religions were saying the same thing and if they were all different routes to the same place. The problem is, we're going to look at today, is we have to ask the question, is that logical? Is that logically consistent? To say that all religions are different paths to the same place, that they're all basically saying the same thing and teaching the same truths. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe there's truth in lots of different religious expressions. And truth is truth. But is there a way that is the definitive truth that actually connects us with God? What if getting to heaven isn't one of a hundred routes or ten routes, but what if there is only one bridge over sin and death and despair to actually find your way to God? If that were true, you'd want to know that. You might say, well, that seems narrow just one way, but if it's true, wouldn't you want to know what that way was? That's what we're going to think about today. That's what we're going to grapple with today. I want to walk through three different lines of thinking about this question, aren't all religious expressions equally valid paths to God? Aren't they all pretty much saying the same thing? And I want to walk through a historical approach. I want to walk through what I call a logical approach, and I want to walk through a practical approach. So here's the first one, a historical approach. People would say, there have always been lots of religious expressions. So what's the problem? 
It's the realm of religion. Everyone can be right. Everyone can have their religion. We don't, shouldn't have to debate that. You know, your faith is your faith, mine's mine, and there's not right or wrong. It's just religion. It's just faith. So they're all correct. Well, here's my question historically. Is that the way that God sees it, and is that the way the Bible presents it? Because all through history, there have been lots of religious expressions. In the days of the Old Testament, there were all kinds of religious expressions in Old Testament days. There was Baal worship. Baal was a, a Canaanite fertility god, small g. I don't think he was a real god, but they, you know, the, the Canaanites worshipped him. He was the god of thunder and the god of the storm. And if you prayed to him right, and if you did the stuff he called you to do, which is some, some pretty weird stuff, uh, it was supposed to rain and you'd have good crops. And people worshipped Baal in Canaan. Then when the people of Israel came in, God actually said, don't worship Baal. But guess what? The people of Israel did. They pursued Baal. And Asherah, who was kind of Baal's girlfriend, kind of girlfriend goddess, kind of a deal, just to keep it all equal there, you know, male god, female your goddess. And, and that, that was part of the culture of that place. And that was normal in, the, in that place. There, there was what, what we would call pluralism, multiple belief systems. And syncretism. Syncretism is one belief system where you throw in some extra stuff from other religions. People do that with Christianity. Well, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus, but I, I like to read my horoscope. And I like to follow the stars, and I also like a little bit of Hinduism, a little Buddhism thrown in there, and then I got Christianity with my extra stuff. That's called syncretism. Pluralism, many belief systems. Syncretism, well, I'm mainly Christian, but I pull in lots of stuff from other religions. And a lot of people say, what's the problem with that? What's the big deal? Back in the Old Testament days, there was Baal worship. There was worship of Molech. Molech was a pagan deity who was primarily worshipped through child sacrifice. But all religions are equally valid, right? Well, in this particular worship, they kill their children. I don't know if I'm going to say every religion is equally valid. And then idol worship. There were idols, family idols, home idols, idols you could carry with you. I mean, idolatry was huge. In those days, the days the Old Testament was written, there's Baal worship, worship of Molech, idol worship, and a bunch of other stuff. Here's the question. How did God the God of the Bible, the God of the Old Testament, respond to all these different religions? Did God say, no problem, they're all different paths to get to me? Or did God say, be very, very careful because there's false paths and false ways? Well, if you're a Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 20. And Exodus, Exodus chapter 20 is God's top 10 list. It's called the Ten Commandments. God speaks to his people and the first two of the Ten Commandments are about this exact topic because this was going on. God's people were trying to pull Molech in, trying to pull Baal in, trying to pull idols in. And God said, bad idea. God knew those weren't real gods, but he knew that they would destroy their hearts and mislead them. So in Exodus 20, verse 1, we read this. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me, small g. No other gods, no false gods. Let none of those get in front of you. The next commandment is this. It's about idols. You shall not make for yourself an image, an idol, in the form of anything in heaven above, on earth below, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. God says, I know there's idols. I know there's other gods and other religious systems. God says, stay away from them. They're small g gods. They aren't real. They're idols made of stone and wood. They don't save. They don't give life. Well, God's not seeming very tolerant here. God's not seeming very embracing of all the different religions because he wasn't. As a matter of fact, God's primary concern with his people was when they would rebel against him and follow false gods. God was deeply concerned about that. In, in 2 Kings 23, and if you're a note taker, you can write that down. 2 Kings 23, Josiah becomes king. Josiah uh, was eight years old when he became king and he sort of had the power of the throne around 17 or 18 years old. When he got authority and power... He looked at the land that he lived in, and the kings before him had brought Baal worship and false worship into the land. There were temples and idols all over the place. And Josiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, cleans house. If you don't believe me, read 2 Kings 23. He destroys the idols. He takes the Asherah poles, this, this false pagan goddess, and knocks them down and burns them up and crushes them to dust and throws them in the rivers. Pretty serious. He, he goes after all these, the, the syncretism, the pluralism that had crept into the land, and he just does away with it. And God leads him to do that. You say, well, that's pretty severe. Why would God do that? Well, if all these are legitimate routes, God wouldn't. But if they're false ways, leading people away from God, God would be deeply concerned because he loves his children. 
In Isaiah 43, verses 10 and 11, uh, we read these words. And, and in this passage, God is speaking and he says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe in me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord. Apart from me, there is no Savior. Maybe that's not very clear. Let me try that again. I, even I, am the Lord. Apart from me, there is no Savior. There was no gods before me. There's no gods after me. I'm the only Savior. Pretty clear. In a, in a time of pluralism, many religious systems, syncretism, merging of religions, God says, no idols, no other gods. I alone am God. Pretty severe, pretty strong stuff. And then in Exodus 20, in verses 1 through 6 again, we read that God says, I am a jealous God. He's talking about no idols. And he says, God says, I am a jealous God. And this is not petty jealousy, like a child being jealous. This, this is jealousy of one who loves deeply and will not share the one he loves with someone else. I think of it like my love for my wife, Sherry. If somebody said, can I share your wife with you? I would say, no, you can't. It's Christian love. That's, a, that's in the shoulder. Hey, no, you can't. But you know, I'd say, no, of course not. Well, I'm a horrible, petty person. No, I love my wife. I'm jealous over her in a good, protective way. And that's how God feels about you and me. He says, I don't want to give you the false pagan gods and goddesses when you can have the real thing. And God says, I love you. So you say, well, that's the Old Testament. Okay, so in the Old Testament, there were many religions, and God was clear they were false and that you shouldn't be part of those things. But in the New Testament, certainly Jesus would be softer about it. I mean, let's go to the, the softer side of the Bible. We'll go to the New Testament, right? In the New Testament era, there were all kinds of religious expressions, all kinds of them. There was the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods. They, they had kind of gods for everything, a god of war and a god of, a god of wine and a god, you name it, they had a god for it. And they had gods for everything. And that was still going on in the times of Jesus. Idols, they were still worshiping idols. Temple and cult worship was going on all over the first century. Worship of the emperor. The emperor was actually saying, I'm God, you should worship me. As a matter of fact, if you're worshiping me besides me, I'm gonna kill you. I mean, there was, there was lots of, let me just say, in the first century, there was lots of religious options. So Jesus comes in to human history with pluralism, many religions, with syncretism, merging of different religions. Is he okay with that? Did Jesus say, okay, you know, in the Old Testament, you know, God was kind of tough and you know, didn't, didn't tolerate all that, but I'm going to be open to all that. Not so much. All through Jesus' teaching, we see this. In Matthew 11, 20 to 30, uh, Jesus says, listen, come to me. You know, come to me, look to me. And he says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. Jesus says, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, if you want relief from the pressures of life, if you want meaning and purpose, he says, come to me, because you're going to find it in me. You're not going to find it in all these other places you're looking. And then Jesus goes on through his ministry and the Gospel of John particularly over and over and over again. He de defines who he is and he talks about himself and he makes it clear that, that there's a way back to the Father. There's a way to healing and to health and to cleansing of sin. And that way is found in Jesus and Jesus uniquely alone. So in John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus has come to the city of Bethany his friend Lazarus has died. He's in the tomb. Mary and Martha are there. They're grieving for the loss of their brother. Mary talks with Jesus. Then Martha comes and talks with him. And in Jesus' conversation with Martha, who's grieving the loss of her brother, Jesus says to her in verse 25, he says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? She says, yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. But Jesus says, I'm the resurrection. I'm the way to life. He doesn't say, I'm one of many ways. He says, I'm the way. There is a way, Jesus says, and you're looking at him. And then Jesus says, I'm the door. If you just turn back one chapter, in John chapter 10, look at verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate, the doorway for the sheep. 
All who have come before me were thieves and robbers. It's kind of harsh. But the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Wow. It's an incredible claim that Jesus makes. I'm the way. I'm the gate. And then in verse 11, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's pointing to the cross. He's pointing to the resurrection. He's saying, you find your way back to the Father. You find your way to heaven, Jesus says, through me. And as if that weren't clear enough, in John chapter 14, one more thing, and this is one that people have battled with, people that don't want to really look to Jesus as Savior, fight this one. But in John 14, beginning in verse 1, Jesus is talking to his followers about heaven and about what happens when we die and if you can be saved, if you can go to heaven. And he says this, John 14, 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. He says, You believe in God, Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. He's talking about heaven. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I, would have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Then Jesus says, you know the place where I am going. And Thomas responds. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? We want to go to heaven. We don't know how to get there. Jesus, explain it to us. Verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. You say, well, wait a minute. I mean, Jesus is supposed to be Mr. Compassion, Mr. Kind, Mr. Embracing. He is. He gave his life for everybody, for all who will believe. He made a way for anyone who will believe. But he says, but I am the way. There's not a hundred paths or ten paths. There's one bridge over death and hell and judgment and sin and eternity separate from God, and that bridge is Jesus Christ. But he gave himself for everyone if we'll simply believe. And so you look and you look historically, you look through the biblical times, Old Testament, New Testament, God in the Old Testament says syncretism, pluralism, all these different religions. God says, you know, those seeking those things, those other religions, seeking those idols, those other gods, he says, it'll bring you death, not life. Don't do it. Jesus says, don't do it, follow me. So people say, well, aren't all paths equally valid? There could be truth along the way with other paths, but is there the truth that brings you salvation, the truth that brings you home to heaven? That's found in Jesus. A second argument, a second way to think about this is what I call a logical argument. So to the question, can't all religions be equally true, meaningful, and valid? And people say, well, can't, just don't we say all religions are equally, I mean, it's, it's religion. It's not science, it's religion. So can't they all be equally true? Well, let me give you, I'm going to give you three scenarios, and I want you to ask if these declarations of different religious systems or philosophies can be equally true at the same time. I'm going to ask you just to be logical with me for a moment and say, can these things be equally true at the same time? So we're, first we're going to talk about what's called soteriology. This is the doctrine of salvation. How is a person saved, cleansed, and able to go to heaven? All right? Here's four different responses to the question, how can a person be saved? Here's one. We are saved by our good works. Do enough good things, go to heaven. That's, to a large degree, what Mormonism teaches. That's what some Protestant and some Catholic churches teach. Do enough things, follow enough rules, do all the stuff right, and then you get to heaven. So you get to heaven by doing enough good things. That's what some people believe. Okay? Second thing. Some people say everyone is saved no matter what they do. It's called universalism. It's become very popular. It's just the idea, well, just everyone's going to heaven. Okay? That's another way of seeing things. Here's a third way. No one is saved because there is no heaven. We talked last week about the Epicureans and how they were pure materialists. There's people today that would say, when this life ends, you become worm food, you go back in the ground, and that's it. There's nothing else. That's, that's the way some people see it. The, the religious system is called atheism. And whether, if atheists tell you they're not religious, that's not true. Atheists are extremely religious. You have to be very faith-filled to believe that God doesn't exist. Because it's hard to, harder to prove a negative non-existence than it is to prove an existence. So true atheists work really hard at their atheism. But that's, that's a certain way of seeing things. And here's the fourth one. We're saved by faith in Jesus by the grace of God. That's the traditional Christian message. So here's my question for you. And just, just think about this. Can it, people want to say, well, all religions are equally valid and equally true. 
So here's the question. Can it be true that we're saved by our good works and also true that everyone is saved no matter what they do and also true that no one's saved because there's no heaven and also true that we're saved only by faith in Jesus? Can all four of those things be equally true at the same time? No. Logically, they can't be. But we don't ever want to say anybody's wrong in the realm of religion, so we act like they can all be equally true. Now, there's simple things in life that we know there's differences. I want you to imagine you've gone running, and maybe you're a runner, maybe you're not, but you've gone for like a, you know, a half a mile, mile run, two mile run. It's a hot day. You're, you're sweaty, you're hot, you're thirsty, and you come in, and somebody says, hey, listen, I've got some great cold water for you. But they say, but well, I'm going to blindfold you, and I'm going to give you a cup, and I want you to drink it. Trust me, it's cold, refreshing water. So you do that, and you get blind. I don't know why you did it, but you just did. You let them blindfold you. You're sitting there. You're thirsty. And they say, this is a glass of water. But instead of giving you water, they give you a cup of hot coffee. And you take that hot coffee, and you just swig it down like you're going to drink water. Have you ever had a drink of something where you thought it was going to be one thing, but it was something else? Isn't it the weirdest? It's like your brain's all set, and you go, Bleh. But imagine you're thinking cold, refreshing water, and you drink down hot coffee, even if you like coffee, hot coffee. Your response is probably to spit it out and to say something like, that's not water, that's coffee. And you would be right. You would be right because water and coffee aren't the same. Now, here I, here I got some Nestle. I could also make you some rich hot cocoa, and I could also make you some nice orange tea. And I could try to convince you that, that this hot coffee, this tea, this hot cocoa, and this water are all exactly the same. They're identical. But you would tell me I'm wrong. I could say, well, they're all liquid. Well, that's true. Well, they, they're all our beverages. That's true. But they're not the same. And here's the thing. We know that. There's no one here who's going to buy in. I've, never, I've actually never drank coffee my whole life. I'm wound up like this without coffee. Um, and by the way, this is me talking slow. Um, so um, I don't do caffeine very well. I get all jittery. Uh, but, but I know the difference. And some people want to say, well, aren't all religions really saying the same thing? Well, some religions say, in terms of salvation, you're saved by your good works. Some say you're saved, everyone's saved. Some say nobody's saved. Some say we're saved by faith in Jesus. These can't all be true. It's logically inconsistent to say these are all true. So here's the dilemma. If you agree and say we're saved by our good works, then you would say people who say that you're saved by faith in Jesus are actually wrong because you're actually saved by the good things you do. And if you say we're saved by faith in Jesus... And only by putting your faith in it. Somebody else says, well, I think everyone's saved, no matter what they do. If you believe you're saved by faith in Jesus, then you actually believe the person who says we're all saved, universalist, you'd actually say they're, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, wrong. <laughs> but we get so nervous. I mean, I'll, I'll say, you're wrong. That's not water. That's coffee. But I don't ever want to say somebody else's faith is wrong. But why in the realm of faith do we give our minds up and stop being logical? These four things can't all be true at the same time. And if one is true, it means the other ones are not true. That may not be popular, may not be politically correct, but it is logical. And we're supposed to love God with our minds. Here's the second area we can think about. Theology, or the doctrine of God, how we understand God. Here's four statements about God from four different systems or philosophies of thought. God does not exist. That's atheism. God is an impersonal life force. That'd be a lot of Eastern religions. That would be New Age thinking. There are many gods. That would be Hinduism, Mormonism, any belief that is, that is polytheistic. They have many gods. Or there's one personal God who loves us and wants to be engaged in our daily lives. That would be Christianity. Can, it be, can all four of these things be equally true at the same time? Yes or no? Can it be true that God does not exist and God actually does exist? And can those both be equally true statements? No. But... So, so, and I'm not talking about being mean to people. I'm not talking about treating them harshly. I'm just saying, logically, these can't all be true at the same time. Here's one more. Christology, or our doctrine of Christ. Some say Jesus was just a man who loved and taught great ideas. There's Jewish people today that would say, we, I believe Jesus was a man, and he, he was a rabbi. He taught some nice things. I just don't believe he was God, but I believe he was a man who really lived. Okay, some people would say that. How about this? Jesus was a powerful and wise prophet, but not God. That's what Islam would say. That's what Muslims would say. Jesus was a great prophet, but he wasn't God. Some would say Jesus was the Son of God, but he wasn't divine. Jehovah's Witnesses would say, we believe Jesus was the Son of God, but he wasn't God, he wasn't divine. But to say this, Jesus was God with us, God in human form, divinity walking among humanity. That's what Christianity says. 
God, Emmanuel, God with us. Those are all four different perspectives. Can all four of those statements be equally true at the same time, logically, yes or no? No. So let's not check our brains at the door when it comes to faith. You're not going to say, you can say these are all fluids, they're all liquids. I'm not a big hot cocoa or tea or coffee guy, but I love water. But you're not going to convince me these are water. There's water in them, but they're not water. They're different. I believe that about beverages. Should my conviction about God be as strong as my conviction about beverages? Anybody? No. Yes. yes. <laughs> I knew what you meant. She said no, and she goes, ah, yes, I meant yes. <laughs> um, but we're open to different perspectives, but I knew you meant yes. Um, of course, we should have strong conviction. Now, should we be mean-spirited and negative and harsh towards people that we disagree with or that disagree with us? Never. We should extend grace like Jesus does. But we can stand with conviction on things. And then finally, a practical argument. Don't all religions serve the same purpose and basically function the same? Some people say that, you know, they have the same purpose. They're to make you feel good. It's like a warm cup of cocoa on a cold night. Religion makes you feel better, I guess. And that's all it really is. Aren't they all doing the same thing? And I would say no. Christianity is unique in the world in many ways. I may do a series someday, someday just on just the uniqueness of Christianity, all the different that make Christianity stand apart from any other world religion. But here's some of the things that make Christianity unique. And I can tell you this. If I could have a Jewish rabbi, a committed, devout Jewish rabbi, and a, a imam and a Christian pastor stand here, and they were committed to their faith and serious about their faith, and if you ask them, would you say all your faiths really believe the same thing? They would say to you, no. With integrity, they'd say, we're, we could be civil and disagree, but we don't believe in the same things. Are there some similarities in, some, you know, in, 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 in Judaism and in Islam and in Christianity? They, they are all monotheistic, believing in one God, but there's severe differences, and they, would, they could talk about those differences. When somebody says all religions are pretty much the same, this is what it reveals more than anything. You ready? When somebody says all religions are basically the same, here's what they're revealing. They don't understand the world religions. Because if they had studied them in any depth at all, they would not say they're all basically the same. They're radically different. And Christianity has distinct differences. Here's a few. Christianity is unique in that it addresses the reality of human sinfulness. Christianity is honest about the brokenness and the sin of human beings, that we need God. We need the grace of Jesus. We need cleansing. No world religion like Christianity shines the light on the reality of our human brokenness and sin and our need for forgiveness and grace. Christianity is unique in that it begins with and centers on love. Christianity from the beginning to the end through the entire Bible. You can say, well, in the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's some tough, harsh things. Absolutely, God is holy, holy, holy. But all through the Bible, he is deeply loving and compassionate and patient. And that's through all the Bible. That's unique in Christianity. Also, Christianity is unique in that it's about relationship and not religion. Christianity is about a relationship with the living God through faith in Jesus Christ as you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not about religious adherence to doing a bunch of rules and regulations. It's about knowing God through Jesus. There is no other world religion that, that connects a person to the heart of God through a relationship the way Christianity does. And then some of you will, will have a hard time with this, but I'll tell you it's true. And if you do your homework, you'll find out it's true. Christianity is unique in that it has done more to strengthen and build culture than any other movement in the history of the world. And you will not get that from a university. You will not get that from a lot of intellectuals of our day. They'll say, oh, Christianity is the worst hate-mongering, horrible movement in the history of the world. Look at the Salem witch trials. Look at the Crusades. Look, they'll, they'll, they'll pick out a few times in history where, listen closely, where Christians did some really bad things that didn't honor God at all. We wouldn't deny that at all. But you follow the history of any religion because it involves human beings. There's bad stuff that's happened in every religion because of the people in it. But if you look around the history of the world and you say, where, when there has been famine and pain and loss and disasters, who is it that floods into those places to help instead of running away? You know who it is? Christians and Christian organizations all through history. During plagues in the Middle Ages, when everybody left those who were dying, the Christians went in and helped them and died with them. We've got a group of people right now traveling down to Mexico from Shoreline Church to help in an orphanage. 
Christians giving their time, their vacation, their money to help people in need. You look around the world where there's educational institutions. And you know who built most of the schools and started most of the education through history? Christians. Even though many of those places of higher learning now do not honor God and don't say they believe in him, those were started by people who believed in Jesus. You look for hospitals and medical help around the world. You know who started most of those hospitals even to this day? Christians. Have Christians done some stupid, ugly, mean things through history? Yes. But there's no movement in the history of the world that has brought love and grace and compassion and help to this planet more than the Christian church. Study it. Look into it. It's absolutely true. And that's the heart of Jesus. And also Christian, Christianity answers the deepest questions of life and the longing of the human heart. What we long for, what we need, God offers through Jesus. And he offers a way home and a way back to him through faith in him. I drove down to my dad's this last week. All across California, off the freeway. And there's lots of other ways I could have got there. But if there was only one way to get there, I would have taken that way. <laughs> Going to my dad's house, there's lots of routes. I want to finish with this thought. What if God in the Old Testament was right and Jesus, God with us in the New Testament was right? And there's one way. And God's made that way available to anybody who will believe. If it's true that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, wouldn't it make sense that we would invite people to know who he is, to point the way to Jesus? It would be logical. It would be the compassionate thing to do. If you believe in Jesus, if you've met him, if you know him, and you know he's the way, he's changed your life and he changed others' lives. Listen closely. If you're a Christian, you don't beat up on other people, you don't mock them, you don't make fun of them, you don't belittle them. But if you know the way and you know the truth and you know the life, you gently but clearly share it. That makes a lot of sense. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that in a world of plural, pluralism with all different perspectives, you've entered with truth. That you, you've shined the light into a dark world. And I pray that, that we would know you and love you with our whole hearts. We would pursue you and follow you with all of our soul. And we would use these minds you've given to us that we would be logically consistent. That we wouldn't buy the idea that every religion is the same or every path leads to the same destiny because it doesn't make sense because you say it isn't the truth. But there is a way. And you've made that way. And that way is big enough for anyone who will believe. Use us to share that message and that love and that light with others. To point the way to you who love them and have made a way for them as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a parent, if you hope to be a parent someday, if you know a parent, encourage them to sign up for Sacred Parenting this Friday and Saturday. If you want to be married someday, anticipate being married someday, show up Sunday night for a sacred uh, search. And if you want prayer, we have folks up front. They'd love to pray with you. If you are new at Shoreline, before you leave, do us one, one favor. Just go out the doors to the left, the Connection Center, and just go and say, I'm new here, first time here. And they want to give you a gift. Thank you for coming and answering your questions. God bless you. Have a great day. Like I said last week, God's given you a wonderful mind. Use it for his glory. Have a great, have a great week. <laughs>